All right, we're talking about thriving and prospering in the new solar minimum, which basically means it's going to be getting colder. David with ADAPT 2030. So Dave, how does the uh, sun affect our climate? The sun goes through different phases depending on the Birkeland currents that are coming to power our sun. And when the sun does get, go into a reduced minimum activity, Earth will also get cooler by a couple of degrees. And it might not sound like a lot, two to three degrees cooler, but that does affect food production. And it's on a systematic loop. It's happened before. It will happen again. We know when it's happened before several times in history. I put up a chart here showing the Chinese collapse of dynasties when the solar minimums occurred, as well as what we have cataloged through the Western sciences here. All right. Well, let's just say that the Chinese dynasties collapsed because they couldn't feed their people. They couldn't feed their people because there was too much snow. Well, the weather patterns became erratic where there was too much snow, too much rain. It was drier in some places. Just the entire what you consider as a static system to grow food year upon year, you plant in this month, you harvest in this month, was totally sent out of whack. All right, now you can prove that this has happened before and you have data and information and they're on the, the following slides. Right, it's not my own data, but this record keeping goes back to the 1640s and as well with the new modern era satellites from the 1970s, we get much more detailed measurements. The different types of angstrom measurements are all showing that we're going into reduced solar output and the amount of sunspots that we're going to have coming through here will bring us into a cold era. There are signs that there is reduced solar output. What are some of those signs? It's coincided and ties in with the cosmic ray increases which allow more low cloud formation up to about 15,000 feet and what will happen is there'll be these atmospheric compression events where we're getting you know three feet of hail along the equator twice within a single month. Uh, eight, eight feet of snow and, and 18 hours in Capricotta, southern Italy. Icebergs coming across here in Cape Cod. 300 year snow records broken in Hokkaido, Japan. There's snows in Vietnam. All tied record snows in Nova Scotia. Halifax receiving 18 times the normal snowfall this year. Boston, as you know, 270 year snow records broken. Newfoundland, also, all-time record snows from the 1700s when record-keeping began. Buffalo, all-time snows there. And that place snows every year, probably the most in the United States. And it had the most snow ever recorded, ever. You know, you get snow on the beaches in California, the thicker ice in the Great Lakes this year. Ice covering lasting months, months, months longer. Uh, massive ice flows on the rivers extending and pushing out during the breakup in spring. A kilometer in and decimating a Civil War cemetery overflowing an ice that hasn't been touched since the 1860s, so we're at least exceeding the 1860s cold. This is all caused by cosmic rays, but briefly and simply, how do cosmic rays affect our climate? They act as nuclei for cloud formation. So when the sun's in an active phase, the magnetosphere is charging our planet, and our magnetosphere also is stronger. I would say shields are up at that point, so less cosmic rays are allowed to penetrate through our atmosphere when our magnetic field is at a higher strength. And when the sun goes into a solar hibernation event, our magnetosphere also decreases, which allows these to come in like clockwork over about a 200-year cycle, 206-year cycle, according to John Casey, who used to be a NASA advisor. That talks about global cooling as well. All right, so we're talking about colder weather, more snow. How long is this solar event going to last? If we take a look through history, every one of these lasts approximately 30 to 35 years, sometimes at the longest 40 years. So when we hit the midpoint, it'll be around 2025 20, or 2030. And this is the first full year that we're going into the grand solar minimum. So we've got 40 more years of this. No, actually about 15 until we hit the bottom. So we've got 15 more years of this. Correct. And if you thought that snows in the southern Greek towns and the blizzards across the deserts, and the snows in southern Italy, in Syria, in Libya, the snows in Saudi Arabia, the hailstorms in Yemen, the hailstorms through Iraq, the snow in Iraq, the snow in Israel, the snow in Jordan this year were strange. It's just the beginning. All right, so Dave, what can the world expect during this grand solar minimum? The first thing you would expect is rising food prices because this year alone, Spring planting in the USA was behind by four to six weeks. The harvest period will also 
have to come earlier this year. The plants won't come to full maturation before harvest. The canola crop, for example, was so decimated during the unusual freezes at planting in this spring that they actually had 60% loss, and now they have to replant the fields again. So when they replant two months late, will there be enough time for the food to come in? Why doesn't anybody talk about this? We kept talking about global warming, global warming, the proof, the proof. Al Gore was right. Where was all of the concern about the, uh, the solar minimum? Well, you can't really prepare a world of 7 billion people. You know, there was a lot of conjecture and talk about this occurring during the 1970s, but it did get warmer for a period. It spiked back up, which is also what has been predicted. There would be a secondary warm spike before the cold really started to affect. There's going to be food riots in the streets. The spring planting season's delayed. There was snow on the crops that affected the Ural Mountains in Russia, wheat production. U.S. wheat supplies were reduced, uh, winter wheat. Uh, Russian output was lowered. Frigid temperatures are halting planting. It doesn't matter just if it's a wheat crop. There was a 99% loss of Chardonnay vines in the Ontario region this year. Uh, apple orchards decimated from such cold weather. And, you know, we're going to have to be pushing everything further south. Each degree of cooling, we have to shift 140 kilometers south in our growing. So if it drops three degrees, we're looking at about a 450 kilometer south shift. That's not going to be possible because in areas where the infrastructure goes down when it gets so cold and people start freezing to death in their homes and the crop production is going to be affected so greatly, we're going to have to move further south. But it's just not going to be plausible and doable with so many people on our planet and the density that we have right now. It's just undoable. And I believe that's why the government never warned us. They knew this was coming up, but there was just no way to prepare everybody without mass chaos before the event actually took place. All right, Florida and the Rio Grande Valley in southern Texas are already agricultural areas, so they, they will survive? Yes, they will, and I'm glad you brought up Florida. They had all-time record cold temperatures this year as well. Back This was in November and December. They had the coldest temperatures ever in Cuba, the coldest temperatures ever recorded in Florida and in, in Miami-Dade area. Yeah, they are agricultural, but as the Native American Indians called it the Great White Rain, it used to snow in southern Florida during the last solar minimum in the 1700s. But the good news is probably going to be the water supply. We have more snow, we're going to have more water, whereas they predicted that the next great war will be over water due to global warming. That's correct. Now, the lower cloud formation will also spur on heavier rains, massive floods. You've seen incredible flooding, incredible snows. Where it's raining now, it's going to rain more. But where it's getting drier, this is a thing. It's going to continue to dry out and have a bigger and longer lasting drought. So wherever it's raining, it's going to rain more. Wherever it's snowing, it will snow more. Where it's getting colder, it'll get colder. But where it's getting dry, it's going to have a more severe drought. So we're talking about major changes in lifestyle. Well, it depends how you cope with change. I cope with it pretty well. I think about abundance and prosperity during this time. I think we're going to, I know. Personally, I'm going to thrive, and prosper, and make an enormous amount of money during this time. Other people are going to come at it with fear. If you're just going to try to struggle along and just barely survive this, that's not the attitude to have. You should go in with a thriving mentality. Sure, there's lost crop production. People panic, buying you no know, cold damage across the entire planet coming left, right, and center. Even down in the southern hemisphere, you know, insurers reeling after all these losses. There's going to be a lot of economic chaos as well. State budgets, they can't keep up with the roads this year. And again, next year, it's going to be even more severe. You know, it's cotton's affected, fruit's affected, rice is affected of all things. And when we come through, if you take a look at it, markets are all up. Food prices are up. So you can, you know, go on options further out. I'm not talking about walking down to the silos with cash and trying to get a chit for later delivery. But the backwardization, when people want to take physical delivery of that, What's going to happen if you have a chit from a silo where you prepaid and said, all right, I want to take oats. I want to take 10,000 bushels of oats in 2019. I'll pay today, but I want to take it in 2019. A, somebody may want physical delivery that will outbid you, and then B, the military may take control of the silos, and you won't get that food. So you're going to have to be trying to get some options out on the market. Uh, I follow oats and canola right now. All right, you just said that you were planning on thriving during this uh, crisis. How are you going to do that? By working with my community, 
learning how to plant and grow my own food, which is not an easy task, by the way. It's not some little, let's sit together and sing kumbaya and put seeds in a tray and we're all going to be happily ever after. No, it takes a lot of work to put those seeds in and make those plants grow and keep the pests away. I learn, uh, you know, I'm still in a learning phase on how to grow my own food, but, you know, working with your community, informing people so you can work together as a team. You're not going to survive this by yourself sitting in your room with 50 years worth of food stockpiled somewhere. You're going to have to continue to grow. There will be good harvest years, but there will be bad harvest years. You just need to look through history. You don't even need a crystal ball to see how to thrive. You just need to look through history and see what happened in the 1600s, what happened in the 1800s in the Dalton Minimum. Go back through Chinese history. See what happened during the Tang Dynasty. So we're going to have to re-insulate our homes? What are we going to do just to survive the cold? Yeah, new building materials are going to be needed to withstand the cold. So... You know, what types of investments are you going to go into? What kind of occupations are you going to go into? Would you decide that, you know, you want to get into something that's going to protect from cold? We'll need new building materials, new styles for just almost everything across the board. Clothing, manufacturing, delivery, uh, machinery, everything you can think of will be, have to be cold resistant from now on. Think how you can prosper during this time. For more information, where do they go, Dave? Just jump over to the YouTube channel, Adapt2030. I try to put up weekly, bi-weekly updates, how you can thrive. And I'm really focused right now on the Southern Hemisphere anomalies of the record ice for the second year in a row, icebergs breaking off, colder water temperatures, and also there's solutions out there. We just need to work together as a planetary body, as a species to get through this next solar minimum. Are you ready to thrive? Because I want you to thrive. I want you to prosper during this time. And that's why I'm bringing you this information on ADAPT 2030.